was David and Goliath last night in Milwaukee. An undermanned Celtic squad going toe to toe with Giannis and the Bucks. A terrific effort by the Seas, but in the end, Milwaukee just too much beating the Green in overtime. And Amanda, the Bucks want this one despite the Celtics starting zero members of their regular starting five. Milwaukee went all out. They needed a combined 76 points from Giannis and Drew Holiday. And Giannis nearly uh, played 46 minutes is the most for him since 2016. So here is the headline from Gary Washburn's article in today's Boston Globe. Shorthanded Celtics didn't win the game, but they won the psychological battle against the Bucks. And that topic is where we begin our deep dive as we bring in Gary alongside Phil Perry, who made a similar uh, point today on our call. I mean, Gary, it did... You were at the game in Milwaukee, but it felt to me like I was expecting the Bucks to come out at halftime and like reset and have an answer for the Bucks reserves. I thought the crowd would get more into it, but it felt to me like the whole team was a little shell shocked by how they just can't figure out the Celtics. Yeah, I mean, the, some of the crowd left when it went to overtime. I mean, I think they were just kind of checked out. It was about nine o'clock local time. They were just ready to go home. They thought it was going to be a blowout. Um, you know, it was pretty obvious Mike Budenholzer really wanted to win that game. I mean, Giannis almost played 46 minutes. And then about with about two minutes left, he went down, he bumped knees, he was uh, on the floor writhing in pain, and it was like, okay, perfect time. You know what? He's proven enough. Take him out. No, he stayed in the game. I mean, it took Drew Holiday hitting a career-high eight three-pointers, scoring 40 points, Giannis playing 46 minutes to beat Sam Hauser, Derek White, and the guy. So I think it was a psychological win for the Celtics to say, hey, we can pull all our starters. Robert Williams played 12 minutes. We can pull all our starters, and we can still run with you and push you to overtime. So we'll see what happens later on in the season. I agree wholeheartedly with Gary here, Trini, and I look at that game, and it's not even just about that game. I feel like the psychological war might be over. I feel like the Celtics, plain and simple, own the Bucks right now. The Celtics have won six of their last eight against Milwaukee. I know Milwaukee has all kinds of talent. Chris Middleton is back. Drew Holiday goes off for four. It's, they needed all that to beat up on a team that had – none of their stars. They were missing four of their starters. The Celtics, to me, are just a really difficult matchup for what should be their primary competition in the East. They've shown it now. Again, six of the last, game, eight, last eight games, they have beaten what should be an excellent team, which should be a rival. Six of eight is a pretty hefty sample size, in my opinion. And I look at the matchup specifically last night, and I'm watching you know, Derek White defend Giannis. I'm watching Malcolm Brogdon defend Giannis at times. I'm watching Grant Williams obviously defend Giannis at times. And I'm thinking about the guys the Celtics don't even have, Trenny. They could just throw waves. And I know he scored a bunch of points, but he played almost the entire freaking game. They have so many bodies they can throw at him. I think they are a really frustrating matchup for Milwaukee. And if they are at full strength, I don't know how the Bucks beat them in a seven-game series. Gary, I did make the point just as just to be a little bit of a contrarian, but this was a regular season game. Like, can we look at what happened and, and do we expect the Bucks to Phil's point to not be able to match up against the Celtics once we get to ideally the end of May, right? The beginning of June when we have the Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah, Trina, it's going to be different. I mean, remember, you know, Jay Crowder is joining the Bucks, the former Celtic. They're going to be different. They're going to probably have a different approach. They're going to look at film in this game. But I just think the, the fact is they really, really tried to win this game. I mean, they had – Chris Middleton has been playing limited minutes because of injuries. He played 26 minutes. I mean, they ran their whole team out there, and the Celtics took every blow. And if Derek White hits that open three-pointer with the Celtics up five in overtime it, with under two minutes left – makes it eight then the Celtics win this game so it came down pretty much to just missing an open look so I do think that psychologically the Celtics won I do think that they came away and obviously Joe Mazzulla said hey we're not into moral victories these are NBA players very very true these guys are making millions of dollars to play NBA basketball and to play at this level but I do think to play the, a team that had won 10 straight that had been rolling rolled in the West Coast they beat the Clippers they beat the Lakers they were beating teams up and then they had to kind of survive to win this game with Giannis playing on a bad knee and and just looking just exhausted toward the end. I think that's checks for the Celtics. Uh, well, speaking of Giannis, let's take a look at the Ford Big Board. Built for America, built Ford Proud. 
Giannis' last nine games against the Celtics, including the playoffs. And on the surface, they look great. 33 points, 14 boards, 7 assists. But Giannis is shooting just 45%, not good for a career-high 54% shooter. And Milwaukee's own Mike Felger had this to say last night on Town Fair Tire BST. Giannis... I think we're at the ceiling. You know, we've always talked, even the last couple of years, when we, when he's winning MVPs, we sit there saying, if, when he learns how to shoot, when he gets his shot, he'll be unstoppable. Well, folks, I'm here to tell you, he's not going to get that shot. And so that, that whole next evolution that people were worried about, you know, don't let Giannis get here. He's not there, and I don't think he's getting there. So, I, I think it's over. I think so we're, at, we're what he's at the Giannis ceiling. So what he all right, our Celtics insider Chris Forsberg joins us. Is Giannis at his ceiling? Chris Forsberg. He doesn't shoot the three very well. Mm -hmm. um, and he was even missing a little easy, especially too late in the game, little easy bunnies last night. Is this what we're going to get? Is this the best of Giannis? I mean, so his best is multiple MVPs and, and, <laughs> and being really good. Like, I think we're okay with this. I think the Celtics are set up very well to defend Giannis. They have made a priority of guys like Al, who has had success during his career, even adding Blake Griffin, who you can throw out there and feel pretty good about. I think Giannis is a different beast, though, when it matters and when it's in the postseason. And so I just, I've just i got it penciled in, Trenny. I told you, Eastern Conference Finals, seven games. This is why I think home court matters. There are going to be nights where Giannis is going at the basket like he was at times in the first quarter and is unstoppable, and the Celtics won't have the answer necessarily to that. But, uh, yeah, okay, like, if he never developed into a 40% three-point shooter, it might, it, it, that's fine, but this ceiling is pretty damn good. Gary, is Giannis the best player in the NBA right now? Yeah, he still is the best player in the NBA, and I do agree with Chris. He's obviously a, a, an ex amazing player, but he has, I got to go with Felger here, he has plateaued because we all waited, you know, five years ago when he gets a jump shot, when he shoot, learns to shoot from the mid-range. He really has it. Okay, when he becomes a better free throw shooter, he really hasn't. He's still about a 55, 60% free throw shooter. You know, he missed a lot of free throws last night, and that's going to cost the Bucks probably in the playoffs because he's just so erratic from the line, and he gets fouled so much. So that's taking points away from him. So I do think, I mean, remember, he's 28. So this is the prime years of his career. So unless... One summer he takes the, you know, thousand jumpers a day and improves his mid-range because he, eventually he's going to lose his athleticism, <laughs> believe it or not. He's still going to have the gallops. He's still going to be a physical freak. But eventually he's going to lose a step. Yeah. And he's going to have to learn how to play off the perimeter a little bit more. We'll see what happens with his career there because he's going to have to learn how to shoot from the perimeter to play into his mid-30s. Yeah, those free throws, too. It's just shocking to me that the best player on the floor last night, they were trying to to avoid getting him the ball. In he that made final them when 30. they mattered. Yeah, at final 30 seconds, right. Well, the one thing that you could be bothered by last night if you're a Celtics fan, their last possession with three seconds left down to Joe Mazzula elected to not call a timeout, which is very on brand for him. <laughs> Grant Williams goes on to turn it over. Here is Mazzula on Zolek and Bertrand talking about that decision. Well, in those situations with 20 or some odd seconds left, you want to try to play fast, and I thought we... Um, had a chance at two really good looks from two really good shooters and Derek and Grant. And so it's hard to, uh, in that moment, kind of shift gears. Um, so I, I, I wish we would have, you know, just been comfortable taking either one of those two shots to begin with. But once that window hits, you got to be ready uh, to call one. So I think, um, you know, that's kind of how the last 20 seconds were managed. Um, you know, after those first two shots, I should have been ready to call one. Well, John Tomasi had seen enough last night tweeting Joe Mazzulla needs to stop taking his timeouts home. He later tweeted it's going to be a problem in the playoffs. I Gary, I know um, that you've asked um, Joe Mazzulla about this early and often. Should he have taken a timeout? But maybe more importantly, has he learned? Like he, see, he said yesterday and again this morning, yes, I should have taken a timeout in that situation. Is it just a matter of... I I don't know, self-reflection, doing it next time? Or has he said it too many times that you think he's never going to do the right thing in that situation? Yeah, I think it's just a learning process. I mean, he obviously, as we know, he's a guy who does not like to call timeouts. As I've written, him, he keeps them like fresh $2 bills. He thinks he can take <laughs> them home and put them on his mantle. Like, you can't do that. He had two timeouts left. 
you, you got to use them in these situations because you have guys out there. You had Grant Williams out there trying to make a one-on-one -on -one play because time was running out. That's just not his game. When you see some, you know, chaos going on in front of you, just like the Miami game where Jason was dribbling up and just didn't know what to do, uh, you've got to – Stop play, reset. Now, yes, Milwaukee gets to set their defense, but you also get a good play. You were down two points. All you needed to do was a bucket to tie. You didn't need a three. And so that was a big sequence there. And I and I think it's big for him to admit, hey, I probably should have called a timeout there because eventually, as John wrote, you're going to maybe cost these team your team playoff games because you're not stopping this momentum or you're not resetting, getting your guys one crisp play in order to win the game. Because that they could have used that yesterday. And that's the thing, Forsberg. Like a lot of people say, oh, well, coaching doesn't really matter in the NBA. It's all about the players. And I agree to a point, but I think that coaching doesn't matter until it does. And if you need to calm your team down and you need to be able to read that situation. I think by this point, I would like him to be reading those situations better because it does worry me that it's going to affect them in the most important situations. Yeah, and like I keep telling you, like the your only way you judge a coach is what they do in the playoffs. And maybe this is all part of the learning experience and he'll be quicker with those decisions because he's going to have to be when you're going up against some of the best coaches and guys that have been there before. I actually didn't hate not calling a timeout. You saw Grayson Allen was one of the dudes running around out there. There is something to not letting them get a better defensive team on the court. There was one where Derek White had to fall on the ground because they like that he should have called timeout and advanced the ball before that. Ultimately, I hope Joe learns that it is good to hear him own it. And yet, you know, talk to me in the playoffs. If he's making those decisions and costing the team in the playoffs, then there's going to be there's going to be some problems.